Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. Today's talk, originally presented March 23rd, 2006, is a poetry reading by the Route 9 Haiku Group. The poets of the Route 9 Haiku Group set the stage for celebrating National Poetry Month at Man Library with a reading. Yu Chang, Tom Clausen, John Stevenson, and Hilary Tan read from the most recent issue of Upstate Dim Sum and share reflections on creating poetry and friendship. Thank you all for being here today. It's a real pleasure to have a wonderful group like this to uh, share something that we love very much with. We're going to start today with a reading from one issue of um, our anthology, Dim Sum. Uh, we're going to read, in turn, the poems that are in sequence in one section of this particular issue. Four poets and one microphone. <laughs> Low tide, wind-blown grasses frozen in place. Satellite image of my childhood home, the woods. My son sniffs the football. Is it really pigskin? Women's meeting, the soft voices of old campaigners. Blinding snow. There's no need to understand everything. The crowd presses in. Zen Garden. Windless day, kissing snowflakes on her hair. Sudden squall, the point of the argument lost. Dead sunflower. We kneel for a closer look. Extended goodbye, their paved driveway buckled by roots. Spring saw, the realtor's signs reappear. A small favor repaid in zucchini. <laughs> Circuit slab. His mistake in the air. Full moon, a coffee can of pennies holds the door open. His spotless new office, my dermatologist. <laughs> Trash day, recycling bins open to the rain. Home and homesick, all night diner. Sunrise, the new guppy fans his tail. Mower won't start, busy as a bee, a bee. Last day of camp. Returning my wristwatch to my wrist. Mountain trail, my heartbeat louder than I remember. New snow, the arc the door makes. Christmas Eve, in her pajamas all day, the youngest one. Dad's birthday, his joke rehearsed. New Year's morning, a squirrel emerges from the dumpster. Full moon, we put off our arrival. Red light. I study the face of my tailgater. 
from room to room on the clue board a tiny spider. Even in silence, cat food for the stray, untouched. First snow, a memory that won't quite come to me. Three crows, the message is not clear. As the spider goes down the drain, a second thought. Thank you. <clears throat> and before anything else is said, uh, I'd just like to say on behalf of all of us, thank you, Mann Library, for inviting us here uh, to spend this time with you today. What you've just heard, some of those were haiku and some of them were something a little bit like a haiku known as senryu. And I'm supposed to talk now about what's the difference. Uh, perhaps I don't have to explain that though. Let's see, who, can I see the hands of people who already pretty well know what a haiku is? Okay, quite a few hands. And um, let's do the opposite. Can I see the hands of those who could use some information about what a haiku is? Okay, so a few folks. That's what I thought. Um, so preparing to come today, I was aware that I would partly be talking to people who may know as much as I do, maybe more than I do, about haiku, and also some people who um, might be new to it. I'm going to really aim my remarks a little bit more toward those of you who might be new to it, uh, and hopefully that will um, get us started uh, as we read some more poems to you. And there may be some time afterward, either formally in, in our presentation or informally, for those of you who want to get into this in more detail to, to talk to us about this. I am, uh, as was mentioned, I'm editor of a haiku journal. Uh, it's the haiku journal of the Haiku Society of America. It's called Frog Pond. And in that capacity, I find myself saying the same things over and over again to people who send their poems. And so I thought a good way to talk about what a haiku is is to share some of what I write to people to kind of try and help them out with that. So here's part of a letter to someone who'd sent some haiku. Haiku differ from other poems in some fundamental ways. While the Haiku Society of America and Frog Pond don't have formal guidelines, here are some thoughts about haiku. The defining characteristics of haiku extend well beyond the idea of form. A haiku is not adequately defined as a poem written in 17 syllables in a 575 pattern. In fact, the form of a haiku is one of the aspects of the genre that transfers least effectively from Japanese to English. Years ago, I had the experience of reciting a 17-syllable English language haiku to some Japanese poets, and they all wanted to know the same thing. Why is it so long? Well, we now understand that 17 English syllables contain a lot more information than 17 Japanese syllables and almost always take a lot longer to say. It's widely accepted that English language haiku should be shorter than 17 syllables, though no specific length or form has been generally agreed upon at this point. So that's what haiku are not in English. What are they? The language of haiku is simple, concrete, and direct. Minimal use of simile, metaphor, or other figurative, abstract, or ornamental language is expected. Cleverness or direct comment on the part of the poet is generally not a plus. A haiku attempts to be as close to transparent as possible. The reader should experience the images directly with comparatively little sense of the mechanisms of the poem or the presence of the poet. Haiku derived from the opening verse of a Japanese linked poem called a renku. Renku are collaborations of two or more poets in which each, each verse simultaneously links to the verse before it and shifts away from it. Each renku verse 
is less than a complete poem in itself. The poetry comes from the interplay between verses. What this means about haiku is that it has an, op an incomplete or an open quality. The poetry is completed by the active participation of readers. So a poet can tell too much in a haiku, leaving the reader nothing to discover and no role in the creative process. Haiku arise from an experience of real things and inspire a sense of larger significance primarily through intuition rather than thought. A haiku that raises rational questions, who, what, where, when, why, etc., is usually less successful than one de that delivers a clear image on the very first reading and then inspires an indefinite sense of something more. Haiku are based on the premise that what is most profound is also what is most ordinary. The overt subject matter of a haiku should be nothing special. That is, nothing that one might not encounter on an ordinary day in one's ordinary surroundings. The sense of haiku is that these things are already profound and that any attempt of the poet to add meaning is unnecessary. As an officer of the Haiku Society of America, I think it's probably my duty to share with you the, the definition offered by the Definitions Committee of the Haiku Society of America. Their definition of a haiku is, um, a haiku is a short poem that uses imagistic language to convey the essence of an experience of nature or the season intuitively linked to the human condition, followed by many, many footnotes. Uh, there's a handout on the pay table over here. If you want to look at all the footnotes, uh, it'll be right there. So I mentioned that there were two kinds of poems in, in what we just read to you. And the other one is senryu. Uh, in form, a senryu is exactly the same thing as a haiku. So again, the form is not going to tell us how to define senryu. Again, I'll just read you a little bit of what I share with people about that uh, distinction. There continues to be some difference of opinion about what makes a poem a haiku or a senryu. In form, they are exactly the same have, and have been in, the Japanese, uh, in their Japanese origins. Uh, Frog Pond uh, still makes a distinction and publishes separate sections of haiku and senryu. The difference to me is mostly a matter of tone and approach. In very general terms, a poem that features a quiet, subtle, contemplative tone that features emotions that are muted and in the range of awe, sadness, wonder, appreciation, etc., and features language that is simple, direct, and unadorned with subject matter from ordinary life, this, this is likely to be a haiku. If it also focuses on nature in contrast to human nature and makes reference to a single season and is set in a brief moment of time rather than taking place over a span of time, then that impression that it's a haiku is, is even stronger. Senryu do something else. They're primarily about human nature, though they may use nature images, and they tend to include um, stronger, involve stronger emotions. Um, also, they're often um, more overtly poetic and, and are, are more likely to use uh, familiar poetic devices in wordplay. A haiku tends to arrive quietly and become a greater presence with time. A senryu blows in, knocks you over, and leaves before you know what hits you. I'm going to illustrate this with just two poems, and uh, I'm going to ask for uh, an some help from an assistant. This is Jerome Cushman. Uh, he is a poet. And he also uh, is a uh, speaker of American Sign. So I'm going to recite for you a haiku. Okay, then I'll do it after you? Yes. And then, uh, and then Jerome will, will sign the same poem for you. This is a poem by a poet named Nicholas Virgilio. This is a very well-known American uh, English language haiku. Lily, out of the water out of itself.
Thank you, Derek. So this is a haiku. Now here's a poem that uses very similar material. This poem is a senryu. Lily, out of the water, out of her bathing suit. <laughs> See the difference? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we work on that. We'll do that in the social part. Are you going to introduce this? Uh, well, we're going to now read on another short section from another issue of Dim Sum as a group. Now that you know the difference between haiku and senryu, so. But we also have senryu flavored haiku <laughs> and haiku with a, and send you with a haiku tone sometimes. Right. Twilight shadows, seeing myself as a teenager. Bamboo grove, a calf to heart, still green. Between bites from the apple, he stares. Harvest moon, no button to push for homesickness. Autumn wind, the leaves are going where I'm going. Cross country flight, his first novel from cover to cover. The finished letter in the envelope taken out again. Sudden shower, the white bird shakes out a few yellow leaves. Lichen shrine, a farmer studies the roof Thatch. Walking home from church, sun on the other side of my face. Far from home, a toddler greets me with goodbye. <laughs> Veterans Day, the normal route past the cemetery. Beaver Dam. I capture a chipmunk in the photograph. No play, watching the throat behind the mask. Picture window in all that white, a cardinal. Game over, men turn to leave the TV department. Broken clouds, a goldfish out of the shadow. Evening breeze, the sun dawns over my homeland. Flea market, a Rubik's cube already solved. Children's gardens. All the scarecrows dressed like mom. Wishing well, a borrowed coin lands on the bronze monkey. Summer ending, sound of a lawnmower through closed windows. Where I sit on my usual bench, remains of a knot. Early morning, the silence of good companions.
In preparing the issue, we share tasks, and in the presentation, we share tasks. And my task <coughs> is to give you a sense of the process we use in selecting the haiku for our issues. Three of us have been meeting since the second month of the century, February 2000. And Tom joined us in time for the spring 2003 issue. We have what John calls leisurely meals of dim sum, kind of Chinese appetizer, once a month. By leisurely, we mean five to six hours. We have a very hospitable restaurant and we give them a couple of issues each time and when we walk in, we see them lining the wall. And sometimes the patrons read them as well. During these meals, we share haiku and senryu and friendship. We now consider ourselves to be a long-lasting group. We were told recently by William Higginson that most journals last about three issues. We've now published 10, and we're about to publish our 11th. When I talk about what happens during our meetings, you must not think that they seem long to us. We long for them, and the time seems to fly by. In thinking about what I would talk about, it occurred to me that our process <clears throat> is similar to that of reading a haiku. In this one breath poetry, there is a time of preparation, an aha moment, and then a time of resonance. In our group, this process translates into a time of preparation, like the context of the poem, the group meeting, which is the aha moment, and the selection of poems for each issue, which would be equivalent to the resonance. Our preparation time. There are three to four times when we select poems from a larger group. We select a smaller group from a larger group. I travel to work about an hour each way each day. And after breaking a couple of fingernails on my steering wheel as I tried to use a pencil on the throughway, please don't tell, I decided to buy a little dictaphone. And so what happens is, as I travel to school and back, I will have this in the car with me. And if I have a haiku thought, I will speak it into the dictaphone. I don't know quite what my tailgaters think. I call these proto-ku. One of, one of my colleagues back here writes his haiku nearer the meeting. He calls them pronto-ku. And so as I move from the dictaphone to my little book, I make the initial selection. Some are thrown out, some come the right way, and some are transformed again. Then when it becomes near time for the meeting, we will select about 16 poems to bring to the meeting. And then during the meeting, we will select about six of those. And then the last selection is when our editor, Yu Chang, selects from a pool of about 120 poems, the 70 or so that appear in the issue. So that's the context. The equivalent of the aha moment happens at the restaurant, at Taipan. Uh, as John says, for haiku, and as Henderson says, for haiku, you need not only good poems, but good listeners, good readers. This is what the meetings give us, the trust, the friendship, and, and the sense that a good reading will receive a good listening. We write haiku on three by five cards, four, for, one for each of us. And then at the, at the beginning of the, uh, 
well, there's no real beginning, but at some point early on, uh, as we have our dim sum, we deal the, the haiku on the cards to the rest of the group. And then we usually smile at each other, and the person whose haiku it is will turn over his, her card, and the rest will turn over together. And that's the moment that we have been waiting for. It might be that we all smile. It might mean that be if it's a really if it's a senryu that someone groans. It might mean we have a couple of sentences about a line break or a mo or a punctuation point, or in fact there might be 10 to 15 minutes discussion. And after that, we make our selection. At the we select about six poems each for the pool, and these are used for each issue. Thanks to use sensibilities, the poems in their arrangement in, uh, in, the, in the anthology, in the, in, the, in the biannual anthology, have kind of a, a, a renku feel. They cross-pollinate with each other. And we've trained uh, our publisher in Rotterdam, New York, that having poems scattered over the page is what we need for haiku. It's like walking through a field and seeing one flower and then a weed and then something you recognize and then something you don't. So as you go through the issue, you, 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 you never have a rhythm, a visual rhythm to follow. Um, in closing, two more things. Um, from the beginning, we've had wonderful guest poets so although Tom didn't formally join us until spring 2003, he was in fact the centerfold of our very first issue. <laughs> in poetic form, of course, <laughs> for which we're, we're grateful. And we've had many fine poets agree to be part of the center of the issue. Um, these are poems that are born in friendship. And, and as we dodge our community through our publication, we are very happy to share this friendship, this sense of the aha moment with everyone. Thank you. We're each going to now take a turn and read some of our, our own poems. And uh, perhaps each of us will read a few that are favorites of ours by other authors. You will lead off doing that, and then John and Hillary, and then myself. No, the first thing I like to say is, you know, I consider myself extremely, extremely lucky, you know to be a member of you know, Route 9 Haiku Group. These are, not, these are very special, special friends, you know, and that's where I draw my inspiration. So, thank you. Now, I have this, uh, I have this on the table, you know, it's, you feel free to, think, to take one. No, I, I'll just read a few, okay? In no particular order. Falling leaves, wish I had the time to unwind. Different pace, at the water's edge, the sandpiper and I. Pebbled beach, how carefully she chooses her words. Almost dusk, the raspberry stalk bends with a purple finch. First frost, a homeless man appears in a new development. Back at camp, the mountain peak still in my legs. Warm kitchen, the rise and fall of friends' laughter. A scorpion emerges from a pile of chilies, desert sunset. Another wave. The seaweed still clings to the driftwood. 
O passport, the tug of my father's smile. Happy hour, my son and I piling up muscles. Time for breakfast, my cat's tail in the headlines. Fireworks, I have my moments. Window box, between flowering pansies, my daughter's face. Migrating geese, she reaches for my hand. Thank you. How's the sound? Can you hear clearly? Yes, everyone? Okay. All right, eight haiku, eight of my haiku. If you feel comfortable, you don't have to, but if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Long night, breathing until breathing is just breathing. Applauding the mime in our mittens. Rain washes the street. I've already said good night. In the pollen on my car, her signature. Uncertain which way to face the scarecrow. Almost spring, the scent of a woman's hair in the elevator. Summer sunrise, a man on a ladder changing the price of gas. Fireflies, could I still catch one? That was eight haiku. Now eight senryu. You can close your eyes or keep them open for these. It isn't going to make any difference, probably. <laughs> Jury room. Multiple errors in a discredit. Say that again. Jury room. Multiple errors in a discarded crossword. Did you ever, uh, just I'm going to comment about before this next one, did you ever see strangers someplace and just feel that you knew something about their story? I mean, you might be right or wrong about what you think you know, but just have that feeling. Well, this is from the post office, and I live in a village of Nassau now. This is from the post office there. Thin winter coat. So little protection against her boyfriend. Too quick to reply, cutting my tongue on the envelope. Ah, here's one about Ithaca. At least it was written in Ithaca. Um, I, as I think was mentioned in the introductions, I'm from Ithaca, and uh, I, th I still kind of think of this as home in many ways. And I'm aware that there's a lot of different ways to look at Ithaca. Um, and I had been away for a long time when I wrote this, so I was looking at it with some distance. Tourist town. Postcards of the waterfall racked upside down. New York City. A crowded street. I'm the one who steps in it. So, so, uh, Senryu are often humorous, but sometimes they're just as good a vehicle to, to express something about you know, human relations that's, that's quite, quite sad. Um, my mother, um, our mother, my sister here, uh, has Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a poem that I wrote uh, at, in the last days when we were able, she and I, my mother and I, to share some common interests, some things that we both love doing. Last pieces of a jigsaw puzzle filling in the sky.
Father's Day. She tells me I'm not the father. And then uh, it's sent me over an opportunity to admit to feelings that um, I have, um, the poet has, um, and they're sort of sneaky feelings. Embarrassed by the lavish praise I imagine getting. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to read eight haiku, I think these are basically all haiku, haiku or sanryu, by other poets. First one is by a poet who lived in Ithaca for quite some, some number of years. Um, she now lives in a, the uh, uh, Seattle area. Uh, her name is Ruth Yarrow. After the garden party, the garden. This is by Penny Harter. Broken bowl, the pieces still rocking. By Lee Gerga, graduation day. My son and I, side by side, knotting our ties. Jorgen Johansson, he's Swedish. I think this is remarkable because he's, he's Swedish and he's writing in English here as a second language. Freezing platform, the lights of a departing train. William M. Ramsey, winter moon, you could wake up and talk to me. Sherry Hunter Day, Crimson Maples, maybe death won't recognize me. Leonard D. Moore, I wish Leonard D. Moore could be here to read this. He just has a wonderful voice. I'll just have to do my best with this. First summer day, thud of a soft drink in the vending machine. And Harriet West, finally. Painters drop cloth. All the colors of other rooms. Thank you. Rather than, <clears throat> rather than read poems of my own, I would like to read a hyphen by Yu Chang, with his permission. Uh, a haiban is a piece of prose, which is then followed by a haiku. It's called Refrigerator. One day last summer, my old refrigerator suddenly quit. When the repairman handed me the culprit, a broken heating element, I happily paid $75 to get my refrigerator back. After that, it worked nicely, except for hot days. Then the motor would moan noticeably, but there was no cooling at all. The thought of getting a new one did cross my mind, but I never got around to it. The frigid condition got worse in the middle of June this year. That's it, I said to myself, and, ha and headed for the mall. When I was removing the postcards and stickers to prepare the old fridge to be trucked away, a yellowed Christmas card caught my eyes. The message inside read, Merry Christmas. Hope everybody is fine. See you in New York. Love, Sieve. Sieve Eggström grew up in Göteborg, Sweden but had spent many years abroad, both in Europe and in the US, by the time I met her. She was the happiest person I'd ever known, and she brought out the best in everyone. She particularly loved Britain, so much so that she brought a dilapidated English cottage near Cambridge. Restoration had already begun in the summer of 1988. 
Steve never made it to New York that year. She made it as far as Lockerbie, Scotland. New fridge. The motor's faint hum still there. I would like to start by first publicly thanking Janet McHugh for um, her support of my haiku habit and of uh, allowing us to uh, share our haiku today. And um, I'm going to first just um, sort of share some thoughts about why I think haiku reading or writing can be um, a very advantageous form for people to consider. It's a very highly portable form. It's one that you can work on in your mind um, no matter where you are, anytime, any place, when you're driving, walking, um, in line at a grocery store. It's something that you can work on as a little puzzle about sharpening your awareness of what's around you. A lot of um, our relationships with things are sort of channeled to like bigger and better always being the way things are in society, but there are lots of little small celebrations and gifts as we walk around. And to write haiku, all you need is a little notebook like this. Most haiku poets carry something like this, and as they go about their day, they scribble little notes as they observe things. And sometimes a haiku will actually write itself, but more often than not, it'll require some taking those notes and working them into an expression that hopefully conveys something meaningful. In all of our lives, we're painfully aware and burdened by the struggles and suffering in this world, and haiku is one form of recognizing that while we each grapple with personal losses and frustrations, we can celebrate and enjoy our world ever more by being open to the wonder and poetic correspondence that is everywhere. Haiku give voice to that which is voiceless, and to that which we know by intuition. Very often, haiku acquaint us with something known, but until we read about it and feel it, we are not connected to that knowing. The haiku serve as bridges between our unconscious and our conscious. I'd like to read a few of my poems, and one of the things that I think is very true about um, haiku is that it can be about almost anything. I'd like to start with a few about my family. In the dark, through the window light, my wife and child. Autumn nightfall, dropping my son off for something else. My wife drives a nail in our daughter's room, grandmother's crucifix. Snowfall, my daughter asks where we are going. Here are some about our cat and our dog. Alone with the cat, the look between us held a while. My cat comes up close, then shies away, alcohol on my breath. <laughs> Outside the glass door, our old cat has forgotten it wanted in. <laughs> to the cat, that's complete and utter nonsense. <laughs> Here are some about our dog. Red winged blackbird calls. The dog tugs for another scent. Stuck inside, the dog gets up and turns around. Ordinary walk. Our dog at the end of his leash. 
And then these are a few about Mann Library. Light snow, the students study in silence. It's kind of amazing to think of a, a whole stretch up on the third or fourth floor during exam week when all the students are there and they're all perfectly quiet and attentive to their work and thinking of that moment as something that's very peaceful and kind of amazing to think of all that energy harnessed and studying. Most of his studying looking out the window. A stranger smiles, the elevator closes and goes up. I'd like to read just a few that are by other poets that are haiku that I really admire or have taken solace in for quite some time. When I have sat long enough, the red dragonfly comes to the wheatgrass. I think that's a, a part of a haiku experience is unless you're quiet, still, and open and ready to be receptive to experiences, sometimes those experiences won't happen. That's a poem by Laura Stolting. This is one by a Hawaiian poet named James Hackett who writes marvelous haiku about cats, dogs, insects, almost everything in nature. Free at last, the fly flew out the window and then right back in again. This is by a Massachusetts poet named Vincent Trippi. Across the fields, a swallow carrying one hair from the plow horse. This is a haiku that I think creates a wonderful image. Far at sea, a tiny bird rests on flotsam. That's by Margaret Malarski. And then these are two by Rochester area poets, one by Tom Painting, who's a teacher in Rochester. Beach walk, the stick I tossed yesterday. And this is by Michael Ketchik from Rochester. Waves crash against the pier. The bottle slips from my hand something kind of magical about imagining the force of those waves and having something in hand that slips away and how suddenly there's no chance of retrieving it. This one's a similar spirited one by Robert Zukowski. Two crabs grappling with locked claws taken by a wave. Perhaps my favorite haiku of all time is by a, a Japanese um, wanderer named Ryokan. The thief left it behind the moon at the window. And this is a bit of a Senryu flavored poem, but I think it's a, a beautiful poem of the human spirit. Running his fastest to right field Last Child Picked. That's by Mike Dillon. And I'd like to close with a poem by a Wisconsin poet, Jeffrey Winky, which I think uh, expresses what I hope all four of us will um, uh, give to you today. And that is that as you think back of today, later on, that perhaps it will even be lovelier than it, it was being here in right now. And the poem is, glancing back, the woman I passed grows lovelier. <laughs>